Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm still getting my head around the fact that I'm here at a free conference for women, for women, organized by a man. <laughs> and um, I have admired and been impressed with Derek's you know, achievements clinically as an academician, but he's beaten us to our own game. So thank you for pulling this day together, Derek. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Yes, scroll here. Thank you very much. So. What do women want? I don't know if 25 minutes is enough to cover that topic, but I, what I can attempt to do is cover what women need, and we have used that information to shape um, secure services for women in South London. So essentially, what's the national picture like? So, am I blocking? Where, where should I position myself? Is that better? Yes, just in the standing so the national picture in terms of women within secure services, um, there was a period where um, high secure beds were shut or closed. And there was the um, mushrooming of what you call the three women's enhanced medium secure service. So to date, there are 46 enhanced medium secure beds, 595 medium secure beds, and 990 um, low secure beds, and one seventh of this is for intellectual disabilities. That's the national picture. Locally, what do we have? I think collectively, South London Partnership, which is a three trust, Southwest London, St. George's, Oxley's, and SLAM, together we had 65 service users, both within our inpatient beds and within the out of area caseload, split approximately between medium security and low security. So this is these are the women that we need to develop a service for. So that was the basics. Women are distinct. I think we, we accept that, we agree that. Why? So even in secure services, because the security model or the men's secure service model doesn't fit women. Women respond better to relational security than physical or procedural security. Some of the, the regional secure services for men don't even have provision for women, not even medium secure, so, which means they're placed far away from home. Um, most of them are cared on a single ward, which just doesn't have functionalization or specialization. This has been argued that causes length of longer length of stay, so 25% longer than men. There's been, they've been placed in inappropriate levels of security, so least restricted principles, approximately 8% does not apply. There was units such as hybrid units and enhanced LSU. All these meant that the women were different and the service provided to them was patchy, at best not specialized. And again, significant proportion of women within secure services are detained on a civil section. There's a high proportion of women with personality disorder in low secure services and the secure pathway that women need are very different from men. So even within secure services, the needs are distinct. So the South London Partnership was formed together with these three trusts and thinking, what can we do better putting our efforts together, developing a service for women in South London, secure services. And the key drivers for proposed changes it wasn't all that rocket science. We actually basically looked at our service users in depth, listened to them, saw what they wanted. And the needs of the patients were, we need more community provisions. We need more continuity of care. We want to be able to um, be placed closer to home. And the national strategy, not far from what the service users were themselves telling us, it was basically about take away the level of security, give us a service and a model of care that's adapted to our needs. So, looking again at the demand and capacity, I said we had 64 women, majority of them in low security. We had too many medium secure beds and less number of low secure beds and no community service at all. The other, staff, skill and training. We have um, staff working within women's services and men's services, but I don't know if we have that specialist training and skills delivered to staff working within women's services, and that's something we need to recognize going for through and through. So 
putting all this intelligence together, we set up to de develop South London partnerships, so the secure service. There were three main arms or cornerstones. One is developing a pathway model. The other is commissioning a specialist forensic hostel for women. And the third, converting all wards to a trauma-informed service. And it rhymes not far at all from what Maggie and Helen was talking about and where the needs are of women. And it's about recognizing that. So what's a pathway model mean? It's basically a needs-based model. Yes, we do have a distinction of medium security and low security, but the model of care is specific to the needs. So an acute, we split it into an acute admission assessment phase and a rehabilitation and recovery phase, de delivered in two different wards. This was helpful because what you could allow is change the skill mix. So we had more physical health trained HCAs and nurses on the acute ward and more TWD rehab workers on the, the low secure ward. The, the model supported the staffing structure, not the other way around. And then the pathway allowed for transition of patients to move from one model of care to the other with, in one single episode treatment. So there was not an opportunity for a new ward to come and assess, discuss, admit, and then go through the whole process again. They're the same RC, the same psychologist, OT, overarching, carried them through and through. The nursing team, we haven't managed to bring them together. Mm -hmm. Ideally, that's where we're working towards, that the, the staff working in both units should have shared training in so many ways. So that this is basically a single service, but the model they are and the environment they are in catered to individual needs. So that was the pathway model. The second one, so, oh, well, I, can, I can tell you a little bit. So at the moment, in terms of what we have, we have three MSU, medium secure services, which all operate on an integrated model of care, which means we do have service users with LD, we have service users with personality disorder diagnosis. Uh, we ha and, and the size are different. So we have one 16 bedded, one 15 and one 10 bedded unit and one low secure service, which is a 13 bedded unit. So all referrals to South London for secure services come to a single point of access. Um, and there's a live referral system and meetings. Um, and this is both out of area, patients are ready for repatriation and all new referrals. And it's quicker in that between the pathway, we know where the empty bed is. So if you have someone who needs to come into a medium secure service, then even if Oxley's service user doesn't have an Oxley's MSU bed, then we don't need to have this person waiting. If there is a bed in SLAM, that's where the person will go and we will work collaboratively with the team. So I think it brought service users closer to go home. It improved the rate at which assessments took place and service users were streamlined into the most appropriate beds. The second one, the needs, did they need a community service? Yes, they did. And I think for many reasons that Maggie and Helen has alluded to, women respond better to when they know who is caring for them. And they take longer to understand the team. They develop a rapport, the relational security is much more stronger and actually disrupting that is probably not the best thing. And again, sometimes when you understand the needs and and Maggie talked about how women communicate. They communicate sometimes through self-harm, through challenging behavior, sometimes through ways that are not verbal communication. And if the team knows that service user well enough, one, we don't need to become anxious. One, we don't need to facilitate a readmission back to hospital. We can actually give that crisis management and containment in the community. So I think this, the forensic hostel is exactly that. It's a specialist hostel. Um, based in the community and the community team who's seen the service user through their inpatient admission will provide the community provision. So you will not get referrals to community mental health services for this group. So it's going to be an eight to nine bedded unit. Um, it will replace secure bed occupancy. So we don't think it's in addition to that. We don't think we need that many medium secure beds. So if they can move on quicker into the community, that's what it would be. Uh, it will be in partnership with the social care provider. 
and the procurement process for the social care provider is happening as I speak right now. Uh, and the emphasis would be on relational security, very much so, and the continuity of care. You see the same clinician right from your admission assessment through your follow-up in the community. It will adopt a model that fosters intensive support and rehabilitation, and there will be assertive risk management and crisis management. So it will be an integrated model with primary care, social care, substance misuse, and crisis management. So it's about bringing services home rather than sending them out and adapting to the service user needs. The third one, I don't know if I even need to cover this, is trauma-informed service. So we're going to convert all the medium secure and the low secure ward is going to become a trauma-informed service. This is distinct from trauma-specific service, which actually is services given for trauma, it's individual therapy or treatment. This, the whole ward environment is going to have a recognition and understanding the impact of trauma. Um, and 22 thirds of all staff working in all these four units will be trauma trained staff members from everyone, from healthcare assistants. In fact, actually, one of my colleagues, Maria, will say, from the cleaners, we need to give them training through. So to everyone who works in this unit, it's going to be trained and they will have regular supervision. Why do we need to turn this into a trauma-informed service? The statistics are staggering. Um, we know that psychological and social factors contribute significantly to mental distress. And that link has been well established long time now. One in six women will be assaulted in their lifetime. Women under 24 years of age experience the highest rate of rates of rape. One in five girls and one in ten boys are sexually victimized before adulthood. Violence against young people is closely related to domestic violence and I don't know if that's even close, it's 1500 percentage more higher than the general population. And then women continue to be at risk of interpersonal violence both in the adolescence and the adult life. If that is the statistics of how much violence and trauma and victimization exist in this society, then what's the effect of this on people? The effect of violence to women and girls, so children who grew up in this violent environment have a higher tendency to commit suicide, abuse drugs and alcohol, commit violence against their own partners and children. Women in prison reported childhood abuse at a rate almost twice than that of men. Um, abuse of women as adults is eight times higher than the rate of men. And between about 25 to 40 percent of female offenders reported they'd been physically or sexually abused before the age of 18. And women who have experienced trauma are more likely to be substance misuse users to a severe degree. So if that is what's happening, how does it impact? So the adverse childhood experience study shows the impact of trauma in our lives. And, and it touches every domain, every strata. So it affects social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, health risk factors, diseases, disability, and social problems, and early death. Um, it's been linked to that. So that is the impact that trauma has on our service users, and we need to take recognition of that. How is this going to be different? Well, from what we know so far, it shows that women who are admitted to secure services are more, much more likely to have experienced trauma in their lives and would have been affected by the quality of their relationships. They would need services designed specifically to address violence, trauma, symptoms and reactions in relation to that. So, the aim of this is to increase our skill and the strategies to allow survivors to manage their symptoms and reactions with minimal disruption to their daily life and the quality of life, and to reduce the symptoms and to prevent further traumatization. Now, we might think that trauma has happened a long time ago and it's in the childhood, we're dealing with the past, we're not because what's been proven and shown in that is hospital admission coming into an inpatient unit is a re-traumatizing experience in itself. So we are actually causing further 
injury and insult in ways that we don't, we're not even aware of, in the way we might speak or the way we might go about things. Maggie is shaking her head for me. So, I'm nodding, yes, that's it. Yeah. So absolutely, and I think that's something we need to be aware of. Are we re-traumatizing? Any small interaction could be. So a trauma-informed service will recognize um, this understanding into all aspects of the activities program, relationship, the setting, the atmosphere of the ward. Um, it will involve all groups. And when I said from the HCAs to our cleaners, to anyone coming into that unit, we, we, they need to be aware of it. Um, and we would inf use that information or that learning to change our new routine or our way of thinking and acting. So I have a few examples here of what would be different in a setting from a trauma-informed setting to a non-trauma-informed. It's very simple. One is the recognition of a high prevalence, where in a non-trauma, it's a lack of education. In a trauma-informed service, you will, have, you will access, actively access traumatic histories and symptoms. In the other, it's more cursory treatment. The trauma-informed, there is recognition of culture and practices that are re-traumatizing. I think for me that's the most important one, do no harm any further. So traditional toughness is sometimes seen as the best approach. So, you know, I'm keeping my boundary here, I'm going to be firm. Um, not all the time, unless you know what impact it has on that person. And again, behaviors are understood as having a meaning, as a communication, rather than being intentionally provocative. And labeling languages such as manipulative, needy, attention seeking, that's taken out. It's objective, it's a neutral language that you use. So already the environment is not re traumatizing, and the service users have an opportunity to recover, not just by medication and med from their illness per se, not by occupational therapy, by social work, input or psychology, an environment that's conducive to recovery and wellness. Um, so I think those are the three main strategies we've used to shape the South London um, Secure Services. And this is just hot off the press a little bit. I want to throw in there for further discussions later is I think this recognition is now hitting NHS England. That's more a wider commissioners as we're taking rec recognizing the fact that women do not need that distinction. And they conducted a service user survey, um, national survey. And all the women said a few things. One, what's up with this medium secure and low secure distinction? Do we need it? Two, can we please not move us around all the time? Can we just stay put in one place? And now, so NHS England is pr proposing a new care model. Um, three sites, three units across the whole of UK as the first step, as a wave one, where we would propose a blended service. Um, we are, I don't know and I don't think NHS England knows what the specifications of that might look like or what it's going to be, but that's something the workshop is, um, is going to starting to come together to actually understand what's a blended model, which will look very different from secure service for men in days to come. And probably all you would have is secure service for women and no enhanced high secure, medium secure, low secure. So with that, I'm happy to end.